Hello and welcome to the 2021 HLC Annual Conference, Crisis and Community. My name is Joe Alice Blondin, and I'm president at Clark State College in Ohio and a member of the HLC Board of Trustees. On behalf of HLC staff and the Board of Trustees, we are delighted that so many of you have joined us in this new virtual setting. The challenges of the past year have been daunting, but these challenges have also sparked resilience, dedication, and a renewed commitment to our higher education community. Crisis and Community features presentations that speak to these challenges and offer a hopeful vision of the future ahead. By now, many of you have likely added sessions that interest you to your personal schedule. Each day, other important events such as keynote and featured presentations will be highlighted on the conference homepage. Be sure to tune in to the scheduled presentations in order to connect with presenters and get your questions answered in real time. And don't miss out on opportunities to engage with your peers and HLC staff in follow-up Q&As, conversation starters, and office hours, as well as with exhibitors and sponsors in the virtual exhibit hall. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you in sessions throughout the week. And at this time, please welcome our HLC board chair, Rita Chang. Thank you. Good morning. I am Rita Chang, president of Northern Arizona University and chair of the HLC board of trustees. Welcome to HLC's presidential welcome address, crisis and community, a year in review delivered by HLC President Barbara Gelman Danley. Barbara Gelman Danley became president of the Higher Learning Commission in 2014. Previously, Dr. Gelman Danley served as president of University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College in Ohio, vice chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents and president of Antioch University, McGregor. She has held several board positions in her career including within the Association of Governing Boards Council of Presidents, the American Council on Education Commission on Education and Attainment, the Council on Adult and Experiential Learning Board, and the ETS National Community College Council. Please welcome Barbara Gelman Danley. Thank you to Dr. Chang for the gracious introduction. On behalf of the HLC Board of Trustees and staff, I want to welcome you all to the annual conference, Crisis and Community. The board members' bios can be found on the About page of our website. This board is attending the conference and active in many sessions. They give a great deal of time and leadership throughout the year to HLC and its members, to all of you. I want to thank them each for their service. And a big thank you to the annual conference committee members who have worked tirelessly to bring you the first ever virtual annual conference. We are all very grateful for the way they have navigated this incredible change through collaboration, training, and leadership. I think you will find this to be a great week with flexibilities built in through the new environment. Thank you to Jillian Skelly, Heather Berg, Eric Martin, Andrew Lutens white Rachel Zebrat, Emily King, and Jan Smith. We are very excited to present this conference to attendees. I want to first recognize the outstanding work conducted by members of the Peer Corps this year and always. We are so fortunate to have a large group of amazing volunteers to assist us in our work. Thank you all who are present at the conference. At this time, let me give you a few tips about the conference itself. You will find the week filled with top-notch content on higher education work during a crisis. Expanded interaction with the HLC's community via follow-up Q&As, conversation starters, and office hours as well as with exhibitors and sponsors in the virtual exhibit hall. Featured speakers, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Chief Medical Correspondent and Host, CNN, and Dr. Sarah Lewis, Associate Professor, Harvard University, and author of The Rise. In this virtual environment, HLC will strive to make this an interactive experience 
please take advantage of the follow-up Q&As to communicate with the speakers. They've promised to respond throughout the week. I encourage you to do the same with this session. I will be watching for those questions and posting responses throughout the week. Before I begin my year in review, I believe it is fitting that we take time to remember those who have been lost in the past year across the world. Let's have a moment of silence. This past year is one for the ages. We are living in a time that will be permanently etched in history. Dissertations and books will be written to memorialize the moments. In our hearts and minds, we will never forget. I remember where I was in February of 2020, attending an HLC board meeting. Some of the trustees were talking about a new virus and one of them used the term COVID-19. I responded in full ignorance. It has a number? And so my educational journey began. The pandemic hit us in so many ways. One for me was serving as the leader of the nation's largest regional accreditor. One of the most difficult decisions in my career lay ahead, what to do about the annual conference. Chicago was dropping conferences daily due to fear of the virus spreading. We looked at all the research available early on, and then it was up to me. I have a pattern of sitting in silence when I need to think deeply about decisions, big decisions. I returned home on the train one night and sat in contemplation. The sun set, but I did not move for hours. The next day, I went into the office and gathered more information. I then sent an email to staff telling them we had to cancel the conference out of respect for the safety of all attendees and staff. I asked the HLC staff receiving this email to give me some space and not come into my office for fear I would break into tears. In a few minutes, a member of the accreditation services group, obviously not following the rules, slowly came up to my door, then walked in and put his hand on my shoulder. Clearly, he determined I should not sit alone. His kindness was all it took. I'm sure you all know that feeling. Turns out the entire office was going through Kleenex at the same time. We missed you. We so enjoy the opportunity to be together, to share information and learn from our members. The hall conversations, the meals and social gatherings, the featured speakers, the camaraderie. People walking back up a down escalator when they see someone with whom they want to talk going in the opposite direction. We missed you. But more importantly, we cared about your well-being. As we heard more confusing news each day, HLC's office scheduled a trial work at home day on Friday, March 13th. The intent was to see how well the technology worked just in case we might have to work remotely. While I am not superstitious, the irony of Friday the 13th certainly is unforgettable. The news darkened every day leading up to that time. As a result, we decided that Friday the 13th would be more than a practice day. We told our employees they would be home for two weeks while we assessed the situation. Two weeks turned into 55 and counting. One thing for certain as I go through my memories of the past year, the Higher Learning Commission Board and staff always was first and foremost concerned for our member institutions. We worried about the impact on your students, the stress of suddenly going online, students living on campus with no place to go, your health, 
that of your loved ones and friends, the various state responses, even the federal compliance over which we have some responsibility to review, but no control over how they are written. We also worried about the faculty who had never taught online and the students who would not have access to the internet. The list of worries that we had is long. The more we read or watched, the more confused and scared we became. The moment that brought it home to me was early on, when my five-year-old precious little red-haired granddaughter Harper came over to my home with her family. When she arrived, she looked at me saying, Baba, my nickname, Baba, I can't hug you except around the knees because of the COVID. It broke my heart that she and all children had to experience this pandemic. I am one of the lucky ones. My two children and their families became my bubble. I cannot wait to kiss the faces of those I love when it is safe. Again, I'm sure you feel the same. Days passed, and while it stayed lighter outside, the darkness prevailed in our hearts. We were losing more people every day in unimaginable numbers. We were caught in the middle of mixed messages from those in charge at the state and federal level. We were told, no need to wear a mask. You should wear a mask for others. Then months later, you should wear one for yourself. This audience is filled with people with doctorates, but unless you were in the health sciences area or a medical doctor, you were just as likely confused as the rest of us. To be fair, the doctors and infectious disease experts are experiencing their own enormous stress and doing their best to guide us in a journey that has not happened in a hundred years. New heroes and heroines are exemplifying humanity and empathy every day. We can't forget the birthday parades, the neighborhood in Italy where people on their balconies were singing together, the food banks, healthcare workers leaving their families to tend to patients, delivery people risking their own health to bring groceries and packages to us. Such resilience and human spirit. Michelle Obama said it well in her book, Becoming. Grief and resilience live together. You all have your own stories. And while many are filled with stress and pain, the resilience of higher education is indeed worthy of recognition, great recognition. Higher education is also a place where civil unrest, racism, anti-Semitism, and other prejudices must be discussed, studied, and used as teachable moments. As if the pandemic were not enough, the social issues that divide us grew as fast as a virus, each killing both hope and lives. Hate wears its own mask. Those that camouflage the individuals wearing them from anything but ignorance and revenge. When the masks are removed, a few things can happen. The rest of us can see the darkness in their faces and know the battle continues. In some cases, the mask are those that disguise the blindness of a society not willing to openly grapple with our differences and find ways to listen, learn, and become better human beings. In the best case, removing the mask gives us freedom to breathe and communicate more easily with others. We have a long way to go in all cases. On January 6th, I was in my home office. Like every other day, I had the news on in the background with no sound. I occasionally glance at it between meetings just to see the latest news, just in case. When I saw what was happening at the Capitol, I was horrified. I sat still with tension running through my body as I saw a young black member of the Capitol Police being chased up the stairs stalked by a mob I was scared for his safety and looked away, telling myself I hoped I was not about to see someone killed on live television. Looking away, I made a silent prayer. Actually, not so silent. I shouted with desperation and hope he would be safe. As it turned out, 
He was a hero that day and managed to divert the crowd away from the elected officials, likely saving many lives. We honor Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman. While the calendar year had begun anew, the horrors of 2020 crept through the New Year's celebrations and aspirations for having one of the worst years in history behind us. The January 6th insurgents affected the emotional health and sense of security across our country and the world. When will it end? What's next? What's next indeed? In my attempt to avoid plunging into momentary hopelessness, I remembered the words of Henry Ward Beecher, hold yourself responsible for a higher standard than anybody else expects of you. Never excuse yourself, never pity yourself, be a hard master to yourself and be lenient to everybody else. While the virus and civil unrest remained, a few weeks later we were sent a gift, in my opinion. Her name, Amanda Gorman, the poet at the Biden inauguration. Amanda Gorman, the nation's first ever youth poet laureate wrote, when day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? This young, well-educated woman, poised, proud, and passionate, continued later in her poem to recite, this is the era of just redemption. We feared it at all its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it, we found the power to author a new chapter to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we ask, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe, now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? I believe that the way to prevail over catastrophe is through education. This past year backed higher education up against a wall, which was historically not easily permeated. In some ways, it held strong. In others, traditions crumbled at their foundations. You have made difficult choices, shown a collective strength, and reexamined the entire paradigm of teaching and learning. Let's take some time now to go through that year and the trends that evolved, which will have permanent impacts on the future of post-secondary education. There are six strategic directions to the new plan EVOLVE. They stand for equity, vision, outcomes, leadership, value, and engagement. There will be a separate session on Evolve during which I will go through each of the directions, the goals, and discuss ways we can work together to reach them. The trends that follow serve as a foundation for the plan. The Higher Learning Commission compiles an annual list of trends each year in higher education. This year, the trends inform HLC's strategic plan Evolve. The information gathered provides insight into one of the most dynamic years in world history, as well as a lens into the future of post-secondary education. The evolving information about the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with growing social unrest and a momentous demographic shift in the traditional student population, will impact higher education forever. Despite the many challenges identified, the resilience of higher education remains remarkable during these times of crisis. These trends reflect the changes in higher education and accreditation over the last year and anticipate future directions. They serve as a foundation for Evolve 2025. Trends will be updated annually to inform the goals and strategic directions of Evolve and the work of HLC. So let's begin. The first trend, finance. Colleges and universities are facing significant resource challenges, which can result in mergers, affiliations, acquisitions, and closures. Cuts in state funding and philanthropic donations and contraction of other revenue sources 
are leading to cash flow concerns. Programs are being eliminated, often in the liberal arts. At the same time, new programs are being developed. Students are increasingly choosing a gap year after high school in response to limitations of on-site offerings, extracurricular activities, and support services due to the pandemic. There is a rise in mega universities, many already well prepared for remote learning. The cost of the pandemic adaptations coupled with health and wellness expenses are placing increased pressure on budgets. Tuition is being adjusted and or challenged during the pivot to online learning. The increased safety demands of social distancing and related requirements have resulted in threats to the current residential model, which are expected to continue after the pandemic ends. State and local investments in higher education, while relatively stable, have not reverted to the level seen before the 2008 recession. Increased expenses related to the pandemic have further constricted support. Public-private partnerships are increasing. Luxury amenities, a growing trend in the past two decades, are now under increased scrutiny, yet are still a part of the competitive environment. The high cost of new technology infrastructures and software adds to the financial pressures. There is a growing pressure about the cost of college and the resultant return on investment, ROI, which is creating increased demands for transparency of operations and evidence of the value of higher education, not helped by the past with the Varsity Blues scandal and a, the public shining a light, even on one or two institutions, shines a light on all of them. Colleges and universities will need to make a stronger case regarding the value proposition of higher education. A quality education with measurable outcomes will continue to affirm the lifelong impact of earning a degree. The challenge will be balancing the ability for job placement and the importance of critical thinking. They are not mutually exclusive. Next trend, teaching, learning, and enrollment. Higher education continues to see a rise in the number of adult learners with an accompanying decline in the 18 to 22 year old demographic. The on-campus model is threatened by remote online learning and a hybrid of both on-campus and online. The move to these methods during the pandemic unveils the opportunities of choice for both students and their institutions. It will permanently change higher education, although the level of the impact and change is unknown. The edifice complex adding new buildings is challenged by the growth of remote online learning. The rise of credentials creates a dichotomy of choice, with students able to follow an expedited path to placement and promotion. Credentials can lead to a degree, yet in many cases they stand alone, offered within or outside of higher education institutions. Displaced workers who normally turn to college courses and programs to improve their economic status are sometimes unable to pay tuition and fees as a result of the pandemic. Some do not have access to basic needs and cannot pay for gas to campus, let alone food insecurity. Access to the internet and technology is a limiting factor for low-income students. You remember all the cases we heard about parking lots where you were opening up your parking lots or even public areas were doing the same that were commercial to help people have access to the internet. That's not exactly a good way to have to learn sitting in your car, if they even have a car. The pandemic impacts access to clinicals. These clinicals have really been impacted because it's a matter of not being able to get into the hospitals, et cetera. 
Internships, apprenticeships aligned with programs are also impacted due to increased health and safety compliance requirements. The rise of in loco parentis is apparent on campuses, sometimes putting faculty on the front line of identifying pressures on students. The pivot from traditional teaching and learning methods is a culture shift on most campuses, challenging age-old traditions and the role of the faculty. Faculty have been adding increased training for online learning to their workloads, essentially drinking from the fire hose during the first few semesters of the pandemic. However, the potential long-term shifts to online learning allow now more strategic preparation for institutions. The public is demanding student success, outcomes, and data. Accountability expectations will increase under the Biden administration, Congress, and other stakeholders. Assessment, a big word in accreditation, is critical to assure positive learning outcomes. Research itself can be limited by the pandemic with a concomitant impact on scholarship. Faculty are under increased stress, which has an overall impact on teaching and learning for students. And yet, despite all the challenges, resilience and creativity are emerging that will permanently change the higher education landscape in positive ways. The next trend, Leadership in a time of crisis. Crisis leadership training is imperative. Chief executive officers must be prepared for crises, both those that are predictable and others that were never imagined. So I'm gonna pause on this trend for a moment and talk about it. I've been a college president a, few a couple of times. I had so many pressures on me I saw people retiring and dropping out of the industry because the pressures kept mounting. That's nothing compared to today. We have leaders who are having to make very difficult decisions every day. And no matter what that decision, people are going to be unhappy or pleased. It's never universal across the board. So I tell you about sitting at home and just hanging out in the dark and thinking and meditating and being very mindfulness oriented. Have compassion for your presidents. It is so difficult to be in this position these days. They, ha they have so many people to whom they have to answer. Their boards, if they're public, the state, even if they're not public, somewhat the state, if there are grants, the federal government, the public, everybody knows how to do the job better. I remember when I was a president, I would say to people, you can do this for a day. I, come on in and you'll see what it's like. I can't even imagine what it's like for all of you now. Collaborative leadership of governing boards and CEOs is critical in face of growing health and social crises that impact their students, staff, and the local community. Strategic visioning is critical to all institutions. The most successful plans include metrics, key performance indicator, known as KPIs, to measure success and directly tie to budget decisions. The lessons learned from the pandemic will impact any existing plan, requiring adaptability and agility. And I'll pause for a moment on that trend to tell you that we had to start over again. We had a plan that was very close to be wrapping, wrapped up with Evolve. And I got a note from one of our liaisons saying, I think we need to reframe and redirect. And then another one and another one. And part of me is like, oh, gosh, we've gotten so far. And they were right. And it's much better to admit someone's right than to go in the wrong direction. I'll talk about this more in the separate Evolve session. But we started all over again. And to make their lives e easier, because each group working on this had worked so hard, I said, I'll take the trends part. And I read the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed and all these terrific, uh, they did such a good job and are doing such a good job following this situation. 
and I gave something to our board in June of last year, 50 pages worth of trends and citations from journals within and outside higher education. You have to stay current. Whatever plan you have in place, you have to have that flexibility built in. We also found this year in doing our trends, there's a new role emerging, chief transformation officers. These chief transformation officers are focused on innovation. Resilience is a critical skill set for leaders. Transparency in a time of crisis, coupled with effective social and emotional intelligence, has been de demonstrated to be very successful for leaders. In fact, I have to say a few more things about this one because I actually studied this area. It's great to have high IQ, but across the board in every, every industry, it's been written in Forbes magazine, McKinsey reports, everything. Emotional intelligence counts more. Wouldn't it be great to have both? But the idea is if you don't have empathy, if you can't listen and feel what others are saying, if you don't have a good radar to pick what's going up at the time, if you can't look at your students and read between what they're saying and see what's in their faces, a lot of the communication's lost. So emotional intelligence and social interactions with groups really will separate the good leaders from the not so good. Partnering with external stakeholders remains central to the credibility and success of leaders. During times of crisis, leaders tend to take care of others. They also need to tend to their own emotional health and wellness. The same is for the rest of you, so I'm going to talk about this one a little more. Under the circumstances, you take care of yourselves. As faculty, you are focusing on students. Everybody is focusing on students. Those in leadership positions often, more often than not, do not take the time to take care of themselves. And I'm sorry to be maternal and telling you what to do about this, but take care of yourselves because if you're not strong in these times, if you're not healthy in these times, it's very hard to provide the leadership that your institution needs. And by the way, leadership is not just by title. Leadership is position-oriented, but it's also how people respect you as an opinion leader, et cetera. Take care of yourselves. Over the past few decades, the role of the college president has become increasingly difficult. The pandemic adds exponential pressure on those in charge. With the turnover in leadership in higher education, Preparation for those in the pipeline is imperative. Overall, higher education's resilience during times of crisis reflects the strength and adaptability of leadership. There are many success stories for which leaders should be proud and applauded. So I want to talk a little bit more about leadership before I go on. We find that across the board, less and less people are choosing to go into these leadership roles. I want to encourage you to remember, at graduation day, that's like a medical box filled with pills to help you get through the rest of the year. It reinforces you, it makes you proud, you feel what you've accomplished for your students. You know you've done a good job. We need good leaders. So for those of you who are thinking about it down the road, keep thinking about it. For those of you who are in those positions now, I will tell you there is nothing more magnificent than being in a role where you can impact a lot of people. It's not about you. It's not about your own ego, but it's about impacting others. The next trend group we're talking about, community, culture, and engagement. The meaning of community and town-gown relationships is shifting during the pandemic. Let's talk about that. When you're making decisions to go back to campus or not, you're making decisions that are health and economically oriented to your, I mean, impacting at least your communities as well. So all of you, whether you're national or even international in your offerings, you have a local community base. 
We've read about those communities that are saying, please don't bring the students back. The others are saying, please bring the students back. And we're cognizant of the fact that's a, a sense of problematic differences among health and the economy. So you just have to keep those relationships strong, listen to them, and then you do what's best for uh, everybody involved. While there are stresses on all decision makers during crises, the importance of partnerships continues to be critical. The natural inclination of students to gather is threatened by health crises and likely cannot be fully controlled. The tension to be with others while facing limitations is palpable. During moments of social justice unrest in history, higher education has been a place for all voices to be heard. Do not silence those voices. Free speech is still being challenged on many fronts. We need it at all levels, whether it's your opinion or not, as long as it is done in a way in a safe environment, and I don't necessarily mean set aside places, in an emotionally safe environment, everybody's voice matters. The efforts of institutions to help during the pandemic is remarkable. Food banks, vaccine sites, et cetera, demonstrate the heart of higher education and the concern for community engagement. So now let's talk about social equity and outrage. Equity in a time of crisis is a great concern. The social divide is heightened as a result of the pandemic and its economic impact. Colleges have a critical role in maintaining the momentum toward equity. An emphasis on the common good is timely, highlighting the need for higher education's community to continue to serve as thought leaders for change. Racism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hate will have long-term impacts on movements toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. Vitriol and fear are stimulating many to make their voices heard, which is seen on campuses and communities in many ways. Assaults on democracy, signal the importance of civic learning. Many higher education associations are supporting and advocating for social justice issues related to immigration, equity, and other similar issues. Civic learning and engagement is mission specific to colleges and universities, and each is responding in its own unique way. Low-income students are suffering the most as a result of the pandemic. Institutions will need to adapt to serve their needs. Colleges and universities have a great opportunity to take advantage of a crisis and adapt their culture, teaching, and learning to reflect the need for societal changes that will impact quality and equity forever. This is not just about your institutions, about society as a whole. Let's talk about students, faculty, and broken traditions. Every day you're reading this one, tenure and union contracts are at risk at some institutions, even without declaring fiscal exigency. Shifts in the residential model are seen at many institutions. The new remote learning environment impacts the overall culture of community on campuses. In the future, faculty office hours may not be held solely on campus. We're holding office hours during this conference virtually. Productivity measurements will challenge current practices and hold the potential to strengthen outcomes, but many faculty members are not prepared for the likely pressures that will continue from the public elected officials, and the U.S. Department of Education. There is a critical need to focus on the unique mission of each institution in setting student success metrics, while not impairing students' ability to transfer. Very important. Campus-affiliated daycare centers closed during the pandemic. Their future is unknown. Doctoral programs are being disrupted by the pandemic. There is an increasing need for transfer options both now and in the future. 
their traditional model of students enrolling in courses and programs from one institution at a time, it's fading. As students increasingly are taking courses from multiple institutions simultaneously, this will lead to a heightened need for a national learner record. Credentials and micro-credentials are increasing, while degree completion remains a concern. The two do not need to be mutually exclusive. Extracurricular activities may return to post-pandemic after herd immunity is attained through vaccination. The question becomes how much and how safe will we feel? Questions remain about new levels of participation. Over a year after remote work was suddenly forced upon many, it is highly unlikely that higher education workplaces will remain the same. The long pandemic has heightened the awareness of the ability to be effective from a distance, part-time or full-time in some job positions. A dispersed workforce will be implemented in many industries. So let's turn to mental health and trauma. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is front and center, safety and security first. A large percentage of students are experiencing depression and other mental health challenges. Faculty and staff are also under extreme stress from the pandemic and other pressures. CEOs are facing very difficult decisions as well as opportunities for innovation and both can cause stress. Awareness and fear are now part of the normal way of thinking, if anything's normal. Medical experts predict there will be more pandemics in the future. Many express the concern that remote work and learning is causing Zoom fatigue and certainly benefits for optometrists. Employees are working more hours, not less. Institutional health centers are not fully prepared to meet all these needs. The current crises are an opportunity for institutions to respond in ways that can improve mental health for their students, staff, and others. And finally, accreditation in the changing landscape. The above trends impact all member institutions serving to inform HLC's decisions, policies, and practices. As a result of recent changes to federal regulations, historically regional accreditors are no longer bound to a specific geographic area and HLC is now categorized as an institutional accreditor. The HLC board moved to change its bylaws to consider applications from colleges and universities from all 50 states. HLC continues to work closely with other members of the triad, the states, the federal government, and accreditors to advance an advocacy agenda for higher learning. The Evolve Plan adopted by the HLC Board in February 2021 will be in effect through the year 2025. As with all plans, HLC will continue to address dynamic changing issues in higher education. And I'd like to just put in a plug for how great the uh, press has been in higher education keeping us informed. Now I'd like to take a few minutes to share the year in review in your own words, we ask our institutions to send videos or pictures addressing the past year and how their college or university responded. We also ask them to join us in the celebration of our 125th anniversary. Let's pause now for a moment and take a brief look at what you had to say, and I will be back for closing remarks. Over 120 years, Northern Arizona University has championed student success. We ensure that our students in medicine and the health sciences remain on track to realize their careers to serve others. Our community has evolved and continues to succeed through this crisis. 
I'm Trey Berry, president of Southern Arkansas University, and in this challenging year, it has been inspiring to watch our campus come together. The world just turned upside down, and I was so proud of how our students and our faculty and our staff adapted and how they looked out for each other. I wear my face covering for my family and friends who are at risk right now. This is all about perseverance, grit, and being able to just truly push through. We have our volleyball team making sandwiches for our community. We were the last institution under AQIP and the first institution to have a virtual HLC visit. Our employees persevered through it all. Their ability to adapt inspired me. It truly showed why we are called a community college because we are a community. Despite the unexpected challenges that faced our team, we were able to stay focused on what is most important to us, our students, staff, and the communities we serve. For all of us, it's been a trying year. Our highlight here in Minneapolis was when we were able to host the George Floyd family uh, for the funeral services for George Floyd. I'm proud of how our college community has responded during days of what have been called two pandemics. The pandemic of this COVID-19 and the pandemic that we have seen in terms of social and racial unrest. Yet our community has come together, our GRCC family has come together as this community's college. This year has been an immense challenge for students, faculty, and academic communities as a whole, but through collaboration and perseverance, we have continued learning and promoting the acquisition of knowledge. Over the past year, Metropolitan Community College in Kansas City, we have learned a lot. What have we learned? We learned that in a matter of days, we can continue to deliver the highest quality of education to our students in a virtual setting. If we've learned anything this year, it's that when we pull together for the good of our students and our community, we can accomplish great things. You name it, we made a way to make it happen and keep our students enrolled and safe and healthy. The floods of 2019 or the pandemic of 2020 have lessened the pride or the can-do spirit of our people and our region. The COVID-19 pandemic will forever be a memory we talk about for years to come. Although it has come with many challenges, it has also taught us strength and resilience to overcome the tough times. We as pioneers will forever be grateful for the support given to us from our faculty, staff, and members of the community of Altus during this trying time. We provide community for all, so especially important during this pandemic. Our students and graduates serve as essential frontline workers. Allowing us to focus on student success with services such as parking lot hotspots, running a homework express, and offering a laptop loan program. Only together, we can navigate these challenging times. Believing that our actions can change the arc of the future for better, we are reimagining a better world and we are moving forward together in kindness, in shared purpose, and in hope. We're looking forward to this year ahead and happy 125th anniversary HLC. When the challenge arrives, the future opens. Happy anniversary, HLC. I would like to celebrate with HLC on this joyous occasion. Happy 125th anniversary, HLC. Our wish to you, HLC, is to stay strong. Stay Northeast strong. Happy 125th anniversary. From NAU, happy 125th anniversary. Happy 125th anniversary, HLC. Happy 125th anniversary to HLC. So from all of us here at MSU Denver, happy 125th anniversary, HLC. Happy anniversary, HLC! Woo! I hope you enjoyed that brief compilation of the recordings we received for this project. There are many more. Imagine a time capsule that will be built from over 225 videos submitted by our institutions. We will share them in full as submitted on our website. They're very touching, they're realistic. You'll, you'll love them, I promise you. You can look forward to seeing what your colleagues had to say about this past year and its impact on their institutions. We will separate them out by state for easier access. 
years from now, these videos, videos will serve not only as a celebration of our 125th anniversary, but also a flashback to this incredible time in higher education's history. This video collection captures the essence of crisis in community. So much was accomplished despite seemingly insurmountable odds. The Higher Learning Commission also managed to adapt and stay on course. We wrapped up our first strategic plan, meeting all of its goals. We finished the next plan to present to you today, Evolve. We adapted both of our Illumina Foundation grants to respond to current circumstances, and we appreciate the Foundation for letting us do that including providing an affordable path to training faculty for remote teaching through coordination with the Online Learning Consortium, OLC. We established a new partnership with the National Student Clearinghouse to advance data gathering for our outcomes agenda. The Peer Corps kept reviews on target, managing a hybrid model for visits. And HLC is currently developing a business plan to respond to the changing federal regulations, a new project which began last summer. A myriad of policies were updated, introduced, and implemented. These are just a few examples of our list of achievements. I have one more project I want to share today. The Higher Learning Commission serves a variety of institutional types and often hears from members the importance of assuring that peer review teams are matched to an institution's type and mission. Historically, HLC's peer review teams, as fully as possible from one review to the next, have evidenced this commitment, which is itself a form of what is nationally called differential accreditation. A question has now arisen as to whether this form of differential accreditation is sufficient. We think not. Awareness of a growing interest and related institutional concerns has led to HLC to explore the ways of performing more accreditation activities through multiple lenses that together can become integrated through differential accreditation even more substantially. Various tenets of both HLC's VISTA and Evolve strategic plans make it incumbent upon HLC to engage this topic comprehensively and in partnership with HLC's members. At its core, this new approach would not simply recognize conceptually the diversity and differences among sectors, but it will foreground the interest and needs of the various sectors when applying HLC's common requirements. Specifically, HLC's eligibility requirements, Criteria for accreditation and pathways will remain consistent for all member institutions. However, the application of these common requirements and others will be even more attentive to the interests, needs, and aspirations and constraints of the sector in which an institution operates. We will want to assure that any such changes respect the importance of quality across all institutional type and rather than impair, strengthens transfer among institutions. Embracing change requires the engagement of appropriate stakeholders. In this spirit, HLC will leverage advisory groups to advance differential accreditation. Initially, we will hold a convening to gather ideas and form a small group of our member presidents, as well as listening sessions at this conference. We created an internal committee and received board approval for moving forward with a pilot project by fall of 2022 at the earliest. As part of the project, we will work with member institutions and advisory committees to be determined. This is an exciting new initiative demonstrating sensitivity to the diversity of our institutional types within HLC's membership. Well, folks, it's certainly been a busy year at the Higher Learning Commission and for all your campuses. Despite the many difficult days, we still have so much for which to be grateful. I have covered many topics today which represent the frustrations and the difficulty higher education is facing. It's been quite a journey, and now I want to divert us down a different path. 
I'm going to wrap up today by sharing my own best survival technique, expressing gratitude. Research supports that keeping a gratitude journal is scientifically proven to have several benefits. A 2015 article in Psychology Today summarized the research done into this field, seven categories. Gratitude opens the door for more relationships. Gratitude improves physical health. Gratitude improves psychological health. Gratitude enhances empathy and reduces aggression. And grateful people sleep better. Gratitude improves self-esteem. And gratitude increases mental strength. I personally studied the impact of positive psychology and gratitude journaling in the past few years. An alternate to keeping the journal is the use of a gratitude jar, something that is very popular and easy to make at home. I keep two gratitude jars. I have one here with me today. In some cases, um, I will write gratitude notes. I have a little gratitude card, and I take it out, and I say, what's my gratitude for the day? It might be something as simple as, I'm so glad Sanjay Gupta accepts speaking at our conference. Well, we could find something a little more personal. But I also have one in there which says, great virtual holiday party with coworkers. I feel so lucky to spend time with them. If I received a note of gratitude from someone else, I toss it in there as well. The other kind of gratitude jar is filled with notes populated with quotes and inspirational statements. They can boost my spirit or even better, I'll pass them on and share them with others. I have that one here today. A few weeks ago, there was a segment on the Today Show about the value of gratitude journals, and I'll say jars now, during the pandemic. It takes very little time to write these notes and to keep a journal. On the bad days, it's very comforting to reach inside to remind myself that despite the darkness of the days this past year, there are many flashing moments of light. You have much to be grateful for as well. And I'm just going to pick one randomly that would be for yourself or for others. And let's see what it says. Perfect. It says, you got this. Remind yourself of that. Keep a journal. Drop a note. Share a gratitude jar and notes for others in chat rooms and in person when possible. With all that you have accomplished over the past year, Imagine what is possible when the pandemic is under control. Be grateful the human spirit does not easily break and neither does higher education. You persist and pursue, lead and learn, rebel and rise up. You empower, enable and endure. You provide care, concern, coaching and choice. You are educators. Albert Schweitzer once wrote, at times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who has lit the flame within us. Beyond the dimness of the darkness, beyond the distance and isolation, be sure to take care of yourselves and others. Light the flame. See you next year in Chicago.